Good morning. We want to welcome each one that is here this morning and also those who are worshiping with us online. And we ask that God give a blessing to each of us and that he might be praised on this day. Just a, a few announcements. Um, first of all, we want to remember Laverne Vanderwerf, who's in the hospital in very critical condition and anticipating going home. And so we want to remember her and her family. Also, I was asked to um, remember the camps, the Christian camps that we have, um, Inspiration Hills Camp and New Hope Bible Camp. They would still like to be able to have camps this summer. Um, they have all their staff and are struggling with that, and so they ask for you to remember them in your prayers. And we'll be, be letting you know, um, we plan to record a, a Monday, Thursday service, um, and we'll let you know for Easter what we'll be doing. So. For our call to worship this morning, it comes to us from Zephaniah chapter 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. Savior, King comes to you. Righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots of Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. He will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, it will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Return to your fortress, O prisoners of hope. Even now I will announce that I will restore twice as much to you. And remember, Job seemed to have lost everything. And yet his faith and hope was in God, and God restored double to him. And we pray that our God restores us again to, to worship together and he restores us as a people. And we begin this morning by singing number 297 in our hymn books, Hosanna, Loud Hosanna. Hosanna, Loud Hosanna. Our God greets us this morning in these words, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and Jesus Christ, his only Son, through the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, amen. And as God has greeted us, this morning let us wave our palm branches in greeting to one another and to those who are watching us. 
<laughs> What's that? <laughs> you later. <laughs> You, you, you may be seated, and this time we'll have our, our Lenten reading, followed by the kids singing. Today is Palm Sunday, and on this final Sunday in Lent, we add another symbol to our Lenten banner. Each Sunday in Lent, we have rehearsed one of the last events in Jesus' life. And now we remember the entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem. It is a symbolized with a palm branch. Every child in the church soon learns the dramatic story of Jesus' entrance to the holy city of Jerusalem. Jesus, sitting atop a donkey, is led by his disciples into the city. His disciples and other followers began to cheer and praise God. Some spread their cloaks on the road before him. Others cut palm branches and waved them in the air. They raised their voices and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. What kind of king is this who rides in a lonely beast of burden? Kings are supposed to ride in chariots or on mighty stallions. Here is no conquering king. With the kind of dramatic effect typical of the ancient prophets, Jesus stands the whole idea of the king on its head. For him, the ruler of all is to be the servant of all. A new order was coming into being, an order in which life is measured not by what we get, but what will we give. This contradiction of the accepted order of things lies at the very heart of this strange figure, riding on a donkey, yet hailed as king. The day of his entrance is Sunday, the beginning of Jesus' final week. On Monday, he cleanses the temple. On Tuesday and Wednesday, he teaches and heals in the temple. On Thursday, he gathers with his disciples in an upper room for Passover and institutes the ritual of the bread and cup. By Friday, this king is put to death on a cross as a criminal. And by the following Sunday, the new order is inaugurated with his contradiction of death itself in his resurrection.
You can stay there. <laughs> Just have a seat, kind of spread out if you would. <laughs> it's good to see you guys um, who are not little children anymore, still being enthusiastic and praising God and showing an example for the littler ones who are watching who would like to be part of your group. Um, so thank you for doing that this morning. Um, and so you're going to be the children for the children's message too this morning. Um, a question, if you could be anything but human, if you could choose to be any animal, what animal would you be? Any idea? A dog. A dog. Okay. Why a dog? Because they're cute. They're cute. They get a lot of attention, yes. They're man's best friend, aren't they? Um, we like dogs. Um, they love us no matter what. When it seems like the rest of the world loves us, um, dogs have forgotten us. Dogs still love us. Even if we've treated them poorly, they still love us. Um, how many of you would choose to be a donkey? None of you would choose to be a donkey. Why wouldn't you want to be a donkey? Because they make weird noises? Okay. Um, we think of donkeys and they're called, as they say, beasts of burden. Um, they're asked to carry the load for people. Um, and not only that, um, donkeys, donkeys are kind of, um, we often make jokes about donkeys, don't we? Um, and so junkies are, are often joked about, and they're not seen as a glorious animal. Um, they have to work hard, and they're not something that um, people would envy. And yet, donkeys, just like all the other creatures, and like us, were made by God, and all of creation was made to give God praise. And this morning we're going to look a little bit at donkeys and how they can give God praise. And if donkeys can give God praise, surely we can. And you think about donkeys and what they get to eat and how would you like to live off their diet. And it's not that great. And I brought something for you this morning. And I would like you to each take a couple of them. They're shredded wheat. And I don't know how many of you have ever had shredded wheat. You're welcome. But I remember my dad used to, for a few years, used to eat shredded wheat every morning for breakfast. And it's not a glorious cereal. Um, it's not sugar-coated or anything. But if you take and put milk, yesterday I took some of the crumbs that fell out and put some strawberries with them, and they taste, it tastes pretty good. And... We think of donkeys living off hay and still serving God. And we can even sometimes in our lowest form serve God. And we think of Jesus and he came to serve us. And in doing so, he praised his father. And you guys did a really good job singing, but I'm going to um, ask you to, to stand and sing one more song. And I'm gonna, we're going to try to spread these out a bit. <laughs> Maybe the, there you go. <laughs> 
No? Okay, I'm going to ask you to stand, and I'm going to teach you another song. You probably know it, but it is a Palm Sunday, Sunday song, and it's King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And it goes, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, glory, alleluia. King of Kings and Lord of Lords, glory, alleluia. Jesus, Prince of Peace, glory, alleluia. And so I'm going to sing, and you're going to do the glories. And I want you to do them really heartily. And wave your palm branches. Glory. Okay. King of kings and Lord of lords. Glory. Alleluia. King of kings and Lord of lords. Glory. Alleluia. Jesus, Prince of Peace. Glory. Alleluia. Jesus, Prince of Peace. Alleluia. Got to get into a little more Oakley. Um, and you can all stand and you do the glories as well with them. Wave your palm branches. King of kings and Lord of lords. Glory. Alleluia. King of kings and Lord of lords. Glory. Alleluia. Jesus, Prince of Peace. Glory. Alleluia. Jesus, Prince of Peace. Alleluia. And we think of God came to this world, the King of kings and Lord of lords of all creation, and we get to praise him, and we're blessed when we do that. So thanks for coming up this morning, for singing for us, and we pray that you're blessed through your week as you do things a little differently than what you normally would, and we pray that you're, you're blessed in doing that. And at this time shall we go to our God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come unto you in this morning and we thank you. We thank you that you who are almighty, all-powerful, all-wise, and perfect in every way, was willing to send your Son, who is part of you, into this world to become part of us. And that he was willing to carry our burdens. That he was willing to suffer and die so that we may have eternal life. And Lord, we, on this day, a day in which we would normally be gathered with many people praising you, we thank you that we can still praise you wherever we are, even though it's not quite the same. And yet, in this life. We anticipate something much better at the end of life where we can praise you with all the saints who've ever lived and with all the angels. And yet, Lord, for this time that we are here, help us to make the most of every day, of every moment in giving you praise, whether that be in singing songs, whether that be in making telephone calls, whether that be in reaching out to somebody who's struggling. Lord, may you be praised through us, your people. Help us to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and help us to love our neighbors as ourselves. Lord, we remember on this day those who are, are struggling from illnesses. We especially remember Laverne Vanderwerf, who seems to be on her last days on this earth. And we ask, Lord, that you will bless her, that you will bless her family. Lord, we thank you that you can carry all of our burdens better than we can. And we pray, too, for others who are, many others, who are having treatments for cancer and whose immune systems are low. And we ask that you will bless them and give them strength and protect them from this virus. And we pray, too, that you will be with those who are struggling, maybe not with sickness, but the results of what our nation is going through, what the world is going through. There are many who have lost their jobs. 
There are many whose businesses are struggling and they stand in wonder as to what they are to do. And we ask, Lord, that you will bless them, that you will give them the encouragement that you are still with them and that you will provide. We ask, too, that you will be with our, our nation's leaders, with our president, with the Congress, and the decisions that they make. We pray that you will be with our governor and the governors of all the states. We pray, Lord, that you will be with all the nations of the world as they seek to find a way to deal with this problem. Lord, in all our searching, may we turn to you. May we turn to you and may you give wisdom. And we ask, Lord, that you will bless. And that when this is done, the peoples may praise you. Praise you for your healing. Praise you that you have brought us through this. Lord, we know that in ourselves, we cannot do anything. Help us to fully rely on you for this day and each day. We ask that you will be with children, students, whether they be preschool through college. And we ask that you will bless them as they try to do school in a new way. We pray, too, that you will be with teachers as they try to teach in a new way, and we ask that each one may be blessed, that they may be blessed in doing their best, their best for you. Help us each day, Lord, to give our best for you, remembering that you gave your all for us. We ask that you'll be with us now as we continue to worship we pray that you will be with those who worship with us outside of this place. And we ask that you will bless each one. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. For our scripture this morning, we turn again to the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 22 And we'll read verses 21 through 31. Numbers 22, beginning at verse 21. Balaam got up in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the princes of Moab. But God was very angry when he went, and the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him. Balaam was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand, she turned off the road into a field. Balaam beat her to get her back on the road. The angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between two vineyards with walls on both sides. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pressed close to the wall, crushing Balaam's foot against it, so he beat her again. Then the angel of the Lord moved on ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn, either to the right or to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam, and he was angry and beat her with his staff. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to make you beat me these three times? Balaam answered the donkey, You have made a fool of me. If I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. The donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your own donkey, which you have always ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? No, he said. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn. So he bowed low and fell face down. We turn also to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 19, 
verses 28 through 44. Luke 19, beginning at verse 28. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it, tell him the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes, the days will come upon you when your enemies will be will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. And we turn also to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 21, and we'll read verses 14 through 17. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple area, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read? From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany where he spent the night. This is the word of the Lord and may God add his blessing to it. Most people would say we're in a time of crisis. A crisis with COVID-19, with our health system. People are getting sick. People are dying. And we don't know what to do. And not only are people getting sick and dying, but our whole nation is in turmoil. Business has seemed to have shut down. Shut down as normal. People aren't traveling the way they used to. The stock market has fallen significantly. And it seems like there's hardly no cure in sight. And we're wondering, we're wondering what we should do. And there's many opinions. There's many opinions. And I think it's important that we get our opinion, our perspective, first of all, from God's Word. Because you can listen to doctors who are educated and get opposite opinions. You can get financial people who are well-educated and get opposite opinions. You get governors and leaders 
who have different opinions on what to do. And when we're in a time of crisis, I think it's always important that we go to, to God's word. And these verses were pointed out to me a couple of weeks ago, and I'd like to read them to you. It comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 through 11, where Paul writes, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we've set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. As you help us by your prayers, then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. See, throughout time, God's people have gone through difficult times. And yet, they never get through the difficult times on their own. It's only by the gracious help of God that we get through them. And it's important we go to our God in prayer. And God hears our prayer. And he answers them. In the book of 2 Chronicles 7, it says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and, I, and pray, then will I heal them and bless their land. And we have a God who cares for us, and he sees us where we're at. And yet, we often forget, do we not? We forget that we were made in God's image to give him glory and praise. The Westminster Catechism puts it well. What is the chief end of man, is the question. And it's to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's our purpose in life. And yet we often forget, do we not? We forget that our primary purpose is to glorify God and give him praise. We often get a bit distracted. And as we look at this story in Numbers 22, there's a bit of history there. Last week we looked at the story of how the people grumbled against Moses and... God was angry with them and sent snakes to bite them, and many of them died. But Moses fastened a bronze snake to a pole, and when the people looked to it, they were healed. And we're reminded that God uses different means to heal us, whether it be medicine, whether it be someone else coming to help us, but it's still God who does the healing. And the people often would forget that. But in the rest of chapter 21 of Numbers, the people then encounter a couple of different armies, the Amorites and, and Bashan, and they had a couple of kings, Sion and Og, and they were considered very formidable opponents. And yet, God blessed his people and they defeated them. And their neighbors from Moab and Midian saw what had happened and they were terrified and Balak the king of Moab is worried about it and he sends to Midian to a, a man named Balaam who was considered a diviner or someone who was in touch with God and he asked them to come and curse the Israelites so that he could defeat them. And Balaam gets the message and he tells the people who came to him, I have to ask God about it. God comes to him in the night. He doesn't ask God, but God comes to him. And he tells them, send them away. Have nothing to do with them. I want you to bless my people, not curse. And so in the morning... Balaam sends them away. And they go back to Balak and tell him, 
And Balaam, Balak sends other people to Balaam. He realizes his only hope is in God cursing the Israelites. And they offer Balaam a lot of money. And Balaam says, we'll see what God says. He knew how God felt about it. He should have told them, go back. I can't do it. God wants to bless the Israelites. But instead, he invites them to stay the night. And God comes to him again. And God is not happy with Balaam, but he allows him. He says, go ahead and go with him. You know how I feel about it. Sometimes as parents, we can do that, can't we? Our kids ask us, can I do this? Can I do this? I said, no. The next day, can I do this? Can I do this again? And finally, our patience gets thin, and we say, okay, do it then. But you're going to have to deal with the problem. That's kind of how God is dealing. He's dealing with Balaam, and he allows him to go, even though it said God was very angry. And Balaam gets on his donkey, and he heads out to Moab to meet with Balak so he can curse the Israelites. And on the way, an angel of the Lord stands in the road. And the donkey goes off the road. Just imagine today if you're riding a donkey, and he went off the road. Even your car went off the road in the ditch, and there's water in the ditch. And you'd be a bit disgusted, would you not? And Balaam is really disgusted, and he beats his donkey. Get back on the road. The donkey goes a ways further, and it's kind of narrow, and the angel of the Lord stands in the road again. And the donkey squeezes by on one side so he can get past, and he smashes Balaam's foot against the side. Balaam again is angry and beats his donkey and they go a little further, and it's very narrow, and the angel stands in the road, and the donkey gives up. He just lays down. And Balaam beats him again, and God uses the donkey. God uses the donkey to speak to Balaam, but also to each of us. Why did you beat me, he said. Balaam says, because you made a fool out of me. You made a fool out of me in front of these other people. And the donkey says, have I ever done that before? Have I not been your faithful donkey? And Balaam acknowledges, yes, you have. And then God opens Balaam's eyes. And he sees the angel standing before him. And he's humbled, realizing the angel would have killed him. And the angel even says to him, he says, I would have killed you had the donkey not gone around me or laid down, but I would have let the donkey live. The donkey was better than you. He was serving me better than you. And it's humbling, is it not? That we get in our minds what we want to do, and we ignore what God's trying to say to us. And sometimes even a donkey can be more obedient to God than we can. Oftentimes, we would do well. We would do well to try to seek God's perspective on things rather than to try to do it our way. And Balaam was a guy who he knew he had to please God. And he had told them that. And yet he wanted it both ways, did he not? And oftentimes we're that way too. We want God's blessing on what we do, but we want to do it our way. And we can be kind of fair-weather Christians. When things are going good, we can really be praising God. God is blessing us. And when things are going bad, we can wonder, where is God? And as we mentioned last week, probably God is trying to draw us closer to him. And God was 
wants his people to be in touch with him. And yet we often try to do things our way. We try to do things the way we think that will be best for us, rather than what will bring glory to God. As we look at Jesus, Jesus came to this earth to do his Father's will. And he said to his Father in the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives, just a week later after the story we read, not my will, but thine be done. But in the story that we read today, Jesus comes down from the Mount of Olives. And before he comes down, he sends a couple disciples to go and get a donkey. And it's a colt. A donkey that's never been ridden before. And somebody who didn't know why it was needed. And he sends the disciples and they go and untie the donkey and the owner sees him untying the donkey, and he says, what are you doing? Just imagine if somebody came to your place, and they're getting in your car. He you said, what are you doing? And they say, the Lord needs it. How many of you say, go ahead, take my car? Amazingly, they say, go ahead, take the donkey. And it's a donkey that's never been ridden. They bring it to Jesus. And the donkey performs perfectly. He allows Jesus to ride him down to Jerusalem. The donkey, the people who owned him, were giving God glory in submitting themselves to Jesus, the King of Kings. And you and I do well to submit ourselves to doing God's will as well. And yet, the Pharisees who were with them weren't so impressed. When the people started chanting, they laid down palm branches, they laid down their coats, and they treated him like a king. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And the Pharisees said to Jesus, tell your disciples to be quiet. This is blasphemous to us. And Jesus says to them, if they were quiet, the rocks would cry out. See, all of creation was made for the glory and praise of God. And we don't want to have the rocks cry out, do we? We don't want earthquakes and volcanoes to come. And yet God is, shows his power through them too. But he would like us to give him praise. How well are we doing? How well are we doing as God's people in giving him praise? The little children did very well. And yet the Pharisees didn't appreciate it. The teachers of the law who knew the scriptures after Jesus had healed the blind, the lame, and the children and the people were praising him they were indignant. They were angry. And they told Jesus, ask them to stop. And Jesus said, have you never heard that from the lips of little children I will be praised? And oftentimes when we're kids, we can do very well in giving praise, can we not? We think about our Christmas programs and how enthusiastic kids can be. We get a little older and our praise is a bit refrained, is it not? It's not quite as much. And yet it should be more as we get older, as we get to learn what God has done for us. And we find our hope in him, but all too often we find our hope in ourselves rather than in our God. We are blessed. We are blessed to have a God who loves us so much that he sent his one and only son, the King of Kings, to us to carry our burdens to the cross, burdens we couldn't carry. And he bled and died for you and me that we might live. 
We think of the situation today. And we wonder what God is up to. Jesus looked at the city of Jerusalem and he knew what would happen. He was rejected. Jerusalem would be destroyed. As people were called to give God praise. And yet if we read through scripture, we know how it ends. Christ will return. And the world will stop. The world will stop as we know it. Maybe we're getting a little taste of what will happen to wake us up. See, often, too often, we put our focus on other things. We look at athletes and how much they get paid, and we kind of glorify them, do we not? The athletes are not going to save us. Whether they be football, basketball, any athlete, track stars. There's no Olympics this year. Maybe God's sending us a message. We think about celebrities and the shows that they have and they bring in thousands of people and all kinds of money. And those celebrities will not save us. We think about our nation that we live in, a nation that has done very well a president who's leading us. And our nation won't save us. Our president isn't able to save us. Congress isn't able to save us. We think about our money, our money that sometimes we've saved up and accumulated a fair amount. We think for the rest of our lives, our money won't save us. In a day, it can be worthless. We think about businesses that we've established land that we've bought and we think we have plenty saved up for the rest of our lives whatever it is we've saved up saved up will not save us we think about our technology how far we've come in the last hundred years we think about our medical association and all the advances they've had and they can't seem to come up with a cure not even for a virus, and certainly not for our sins. They cannot save us. God alone can save us. And it's good for us to put our focus on him. Back in 1970, Bill Gaither wrote a song entitled, The King is Coming. It was one of my mother's favorite songs. And Don Kuyper sang it at her funeral. And I would like to sing just a couple verses for you. And I'd like you to listen closely to the words. The marketplace is empty. No more traffic in the streets. All the builders' tools are silent. No more time to harvest wheat. Busy housewives cease their labors. In the courtroom, no debate. Work on earth is all suspended as the king comes through the gate. Oh, the king is coming. The king is coming. I just heard the trumpet sounding, and now his face I see. The king is coming. The king is coming. Praise God, he's coming for me. Happy faces line the hallways, those whose lives have been redeemed. Broken homes that he has mended, those from prison he has freed. Little children and the aged, hand in hand stand all aglow. 
who were crippled, broken, ruined, clad in garments white as snow. Oh, the King is coming, the King is coming. I just heard the trumpet sounding, and now his face I see. The King is coming, the King is coming. Praise God, he's coming for me. And he's coming for all who will believe in him, who put our trust in him. And we can anticipate something far better than this life. The Heidelberg Catechism puts it well. When it asks the question of us, what is your only comfort in life and in death? And the answer is, that I'm not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. The King of Kings came for you and me. He's coming again. Let us live each day until he returns or till he calls us home to give him praise. And while we're here, we get a practice. We get a practice praising him for eternity. May God give us the grace to see each day, no matter what we're going through, as an opportunity, an opportunity to give him thanks for giving himself for us. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we come unto you in this day, and Lord, we're humbled at what you've done for us, that you sent your Son, the King of kings and Lord of lords, to take our punishment for sin, to die a cruel death, to carry our burdens to the cross, so they wouldn't carry us to hell. Lord, may we live each day giving you praise and thanks for what you've done for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now let us stand and profess what we believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, and you can come up and place your offerings in the plate, or you can, for those who aren't here, um, you can mail them to to Matt DeWard, and for those who are in Harrison, you can mail them to Seth Reimnitz. So feel free to to give your offerings. Um, And remember that God uses our offerings for the furtherance of his kingdom. And let us sing together, number 300, All Glory, Laud, and Honor.
you'll stand. First, we'll have offertory prayer. Let's stand together and pray to our God. Our Father in heaven, we come unto you, and we praise you from whom all blessings flow. We thank you for an opportunity to give back a portion of what you blessed us with, and we ask, Lord, that you will use it for the furtherance of your kingdom, that you will use your church as it is challenged now to bring your good news of salvation to a world who desperately needs it. We pray that as your word goes out, it will accomplish its purpose, that men and women, boys and girls, will turn to you as Savior and Lord, and that you will be praised through us, your people. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. For our benediction this morning, we turn to Psalm 67, where the psalmist writes, May God be gracious to us and bless us, and make his face shine upon us, that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples justly and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. Then the land will yield its harvest, and God, our God, will bless us. God will bless us, and all the ends of the earth will fear him. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Amen. For our closing song this morning, we sing number 353. We'll sing stanzas one and two of Victory in Jesus. And when it comes to the chorus, I would like you each to raise, wave your palm branches. So if you grab your palm branches and we'll sing together, Victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old this week, knowing that God goes with us. Amen.
<laughs> yes. And if you know kids that, and if you, 